My name is Elizabeth Gerald. I'm the mother of Marcel Gerald, not better known as Marcy. Marcy was a, well, as a kid, she was an average kid. Uh, she was goofy, she was silly. Um, she liked to go to the movies with her friends, um, skating, you know, they would go to the park. You know, she liked to bake and, you know, just did things girls did. Yeah, she was always like energetic, playful, you know. We were always like, cause you know, uh, my room was across from her. She always come to my room to play the game and stuff. Cause you know, she was a gamer and stuff like me. Uh, growing up, we used to always play the game, always. I got this one memory in my head that it would stick with me forever. We was playing the game. Cause uh, at the time I didn't have a game system like that. So, you know, when I met them, they, you know, introduced me to the game and stuff like that. They introduced me to this one game called Dorito Crash Course. See, I remember playing that with them. She lost, and then um, she had raged, but it was like, it was like a rage that it was like, it was funny though. She didn't give up. She was just like, yeah, I'm done with this. Like, it's like, you guys are cheating. She likes shooting games like that. Shooter, uh, trivia, uh, even like, board games and stuff like that, chess, checkers, stuff like that, Uno, Monopoly, you know, any other, um, and she liked to, um, she liked to, like, uh, record and stuff as well, like, whenever I was doing, like, gymnastics and stuff, she always filmed. We went to the park, and we was up there with uh, one of her friends, I forgot her name, and he had did this one flip, and, like, she was like, cause you know, she was like a hype man. So she did, he did this one flip and she was just like, man, she was cheering and stuff like that. Marcel Janet Gerald, also known as Marcy, was born January 3rd, 2000 and died July 20th, 2015. I'm Thomas Jakari Walker. Let's find out who was Marcy Gerald. She was a, she liked to go to school. She wanted to be a, a lawyer, and then maybe one day a, a, a Supreme Court justice. Um, and that's what her dreams were, you know, to go go to Harvard Law. It was, was one of her biggest dreams and goals to do um, is to do that, and um, you know, really make something of herself and become something. And um, all that changed in the year of 2014. Um, when she was brutally attacked um, by this 300-pound animal. Um, I'm not going to say too much about him, but, you know, just a disgusting person. He had literally just gotten out of prison. He was supposed to register at the halfway house in Chicago, um, but he didn't. He, you know, he was from the areas surrounding where we lived, so he knew those areas pretty well. Um, I'm not sure when it happened, but somehow um, after he got out of prison, he had spotted my daughter and he started, you know, just like watching her and, you know, following her around. And when he caught her by herself, um, he brutally attacked her and sexually assaulted her. Um, and this was like a, a nightmare. You know, you have the police coming and, you know, I'm thinking it's an accident when he tell me that something happened. and. Uh, we rushed to the hospital just to find out um, she had been uh, assaulted and, you know, um, that was just in disbelief and I had, uh, they had a, a, a CARES nurse, I think it's what they call CARES nurse, come up there and um, examine her. Then they took pictures for the police department and um, the, the assault was so bad too, she couldn't walk because her her ovaries and uterus were to the point where she couldn't walk. They said they were inflamed. Um, because the the, uh, the salt was too bad and she was a virgin still. Um, the, uh, after, after um, they finished with her, um, 
And, and, and let me tell people, people don't realize what rape victims go through. They have to get all kinds of shots for STDs. They have to get something, it's called, um, it's, 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 they have to get, an, it's called anti-AIDS um, treatment. So, because he was predisposed to AIDS being in prison. So she had to go through treatment so she wouldn't catch AIDS. Then they had to give her uh, Plan B pills, which upset her stomach in case she had gotten pregnant. And these are just things that the state just automatically do um, when it's assault after this aptitude. They just automatically do this. And that was hard and traumatic because she would cry and then her stomach was upset because of um, the different shots she was getting and, 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 and you know, the stuff for her anti-AIDS. That stuff, it just, it you know, it just had her throwing up and everything. So she had to go through all of that. Um, I'm grateful that the police department got this jerk off the streets. Um, and, and, you know, they came and, and the state's attorney actually met with us at the police department and they took her, um, uh, her they, they interviewed her and, you know, she did and she was crying and then she told them what happened. And, you know, the thing is, he never denied attacking her. I, I'm just, I can't understand how he just, he admitted it. He admitted to the police that it was him, and um, you know, when the state's attorney, he, he just he never denied what he did at all. Um, he was, you know, but the problem was he just he just kept laughing and smiling, and you know, you're thinking, what in the world is wrong with this dude? It, I, I don't know. Um, he admitted it, and he just never felt any remorse or anything, and. I did get her counsel and I did get her help because everybody always asks because um, the assault, it, it, it just, it, it she spiraled down um, with PTSD and depression and, you know, it just got really bad. And um, the police department referred us to Larabita and Larabita didn't have any beds. Um, they referred us to the YWCA. The YWCA had older women. So that was a no-go. So we got referred then to um, the Laney Foundation. Um, the Laney Foundation was great. The Dr. Summer Matheson was a great doctor. Um, I would refer her to anybody. Um, we started out with home. They would come because she didn't want to go out the door. Um, so they started home therapy at first, and then the schools actually worked with us, and they did homeschooling. So the teachers would come by the house and homeschool her. Um, they would take shifts coming by, uh, you know, so she wouldn't get behind. And then the school eventually found a therapeutic school in Naperville, which was a very good school. And um, they did require her to stay on the honor roll. Uh, so she was able to do that. And um, it was a, a school, you know, for girls who had went through similar stuff that my daughter had went through. Um, and one of the things I wanted to bring up is that you know, Lara Bita and the beds were, they didn't call me until um, it was too late. And then it was, you know, I didn't need their help. Um, and I also wanted to bring in the fact that, um, you know, people ask me, well, where was the father at and the family? And I lost my stepson in 2008. He was shot in the head. Um, you know, he was just, you know, got into it with some guys and they shot him and killed him. Um, his, uh, so after that happened, um, my kid's father, he just, he started drinking heavily and, um, you know, he grieved himself to death, I would say. He just, it was, it was too much. Um, so he ended up literally passing away in 2010. Um, and 2014 is when she was attacked. Um, and like I said, I did get her help. And then um, as we would go to court uh, for him, we, she would, uh, he would turn around and, you know, he would just laugh at us and, 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 and just, you know, just winking and, you know, just very, very odd behavior. Um, and they would say stuff like he has MR and they said MR stands for mentally retarded. He was slow, he was this, he was that. And, you know, he had been in jail before, so he knew what to do. He, I, I just, I don't believe he was mentally retarded. Um, 
I just think he knew what to do. So it was too much. My daughter just asked to just, you know, to get it over with. So we asked for a plea deal and they offered 10 years on life parole. So I said, okay. And they told me don't worry about it um, because he never uh, registered. So um, when he does get out, he'll be right back in there. And I don't understand the point of letting him out if he's not gonna register. You know, he likes boys, he likes girls. Um, I found out his father was a predator. His brother had been in jail. I think his brother was in jail at the time um, as a sex offender. And you know, it's like the whole family is just, you know, something is wrong with them. Um, he ended up, um, you know, at the end when everybody speaks, you know, I had something to say. Um, when it was his turn to speak, everybody thought he would get up and apologize and show some sort of remorse. He showed zero remorse. He got up and, and told my daughter, if you wasn't so beautiful, I wouldn't have been attracted to you. So you have nobody to blame but yourself because I couldn't help myself. He blamed her for what he did. And um, it was just a lot. It was too much for her. And we left uh, the courthouse and, and, you know, it was, you know, um, as a parent, I was trying to be more, you know, stronger and, you know, I didn't want her to see my anger and stuff, so I um, ended up just uh, doing laundry, and um, I was up and downstairs doing laundry. And she was upstairs in her room, um, and I would check on her, ask her, is she okay? Um, you know, do you need anything? Do you want anything? And she would just say no. Um, she didn't want anything. So maybe around uh, 10, I would say, she had called me, and she said, Ma, and I said, what's wrong? And she asked me to run her some bath water. And she wanted uh, lavender oil, and I believe chamomile was two of oil she wanted me to put in there. So I put it in there and I uh, made her a bath for her. And um, she sat in the tub for about an hour, so I kept checking on her. So she got out the tub and put on her pajamas, um, her pajamas, and um, she went in her room for a while. Then I just laid down because I was tired. And she came downstairs, maybe a little after midnight. Um, not sure what the time was, but I think it was a little after midnight. And she said, I love you, mommy, and gave me a big hug because I said, I love you too, baby. And um, that's something we used to do all the time, so it was nothing different. Um, um, and she just laid down with me. And uh, around 6 o'clock in the morning, um, I said, Marcy, wake up, and nothing happened. So I said again, Marcy, wake up. And still nothing happened. So I said, Marcy, and then I sat her up. And I ran and screamed for my son. And, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm visually impaired. So I screamed for my son. And I said, come here, I can't. Marcy's just not waking up. And he came down and he, uh, he looked over the bed. I said, I said, Ma, call 911. And he ran back upstairs and he's socking him to one of the clothes or something. And I called 911 and said, um, there's something wrong with my daughter. I can't wake her up. So they were there, uh, Billy Quick and Keith, who was the, uh, I think he was the chief of the police at the time. He laid on the floor and started CPR right there. The ambulance was uh, right behind them. And um, one of the paramedics said, we need to help her to the hospital. And so they was rushing her out. And then I just threw on my house shoes and I ran out behind them. And my son said, Mom, what happened? And I said, I don't know. And um, I got up and uh, tried to get an ambulance. They told me I had to sit in the front. And I, get, I ran to the front. and. I'm um, getting a seat in the front with the guy and they took off and they were working on the back and we got to the hospital really quick and the doctor and the nurses were standing outside when we pulled up so they grabbed her and literally just took the, uh, the, the, the bed thing the, uh, that she was on and pulled her in and I tried to run and I was tripping over something so the nurse grabbed me and took me around the other side to the uh, emergency room and um, she sat me right there by the emergency room doors and she ran in and she says, I'll be right back. Let me see what's going on. Um, so she came back up a few minutes later and said, um, the doctor wants you to call your family members. And you know, this is like six o'clock in the morning and I'm like, I don't have a phone or person, nothing with me. Um, so she said she'd call and I said, okay. And I gave her my sister's number, my niece's number. She called them. And she said, your family member's on the way. She said, you know, your sister's and them call and everybody be on their way. So I said, okay. And I said, again, well, what's wrong with my daughter? Is she in a coma? Does she need surgery? I mean, what's going on? So she said, well, let me go see 
um, what the doctors are saying. And um, the, the nurse, the doctor, and the third person came and they took me into this room. And, you know, none of this is dying on me that it, that they're saying they need to come talk to me, that they, they're telling me to call my family. And, you know, I'm just concerned what's going on with my daughter. And so um, I ended up, we go, we go into the small room and they asked me to have a seat and I'm still saying what's wrong with my daughter. And then the third person came and stood next to me and said, and informed me that he was a chaplain. And I'm still like in a toilet. It's just like not dying. Them. There's a chaplain here and we're in a small room. And um, the doctor said to me, uh, Ms. Joe, and this is one of the hardest parts of my job. And I was just saying, what's going on? And he told me she expired and there's nothing they could do. He said they tried everything. He said they did. They even um, tried to just even get her heartbeat started back up. It's something that they did. And he was trying to explain it to me. And um, he said, she's gone. She's expired. And it's like I was in a toilet. So it just it just wasn't real. You know, it was like, uh -uh, this can't be happening. And um, the day I heard that um, Marcy had died, that was like, Cause I looked at her as my, my little sister too, since I know her so hard. That was like a pain that I haven't felt, you know, in a while. I, I was like, this can't be real. Like, you, you gotta be lying. Like, and then like, cause you know, it was like out of nowhere. Like, I didn't think nothing of it, you know? Cause like, she was always happy. Like, you know, like I was saying. So it was like, I couldn't catch nothing of it. So, you know, um, when I heard about it, I, I just, like, froze. Like, I didn't even, like, like I just mentally froze. Like, I, I couldn't even think about anything at the moment. I said, well, can I see her? And the nurse said, yeah, let me take you to her. She said, we got to clean her up, and then we'll bring you to her. And um, so she nurse came back and got me, and they said I couldn't touch her, hug her, kiss her or nothing because of the full autopsy. So I said, okay, and she was just laying on the bed. They had the white sheets over her, and, you know, they pulled it out so right here. She was just laying on the bed like she was asleep or something. And it just, I, I, it, it just did not seem real to me. And I'm talking to her, and my sister then came in, and, and you know, they was just like, what? And, you know, she, my sister walked back out. I started crying. Then my niece said, get the F out of here. And, and she didn't believe it. And, and she started crying, and they walked back in the hallway. And, and it was a lot. Um, the nurse said we could stay there until uh, the coroner got there, and she said it'd be hours. So I'm thinking the whole family had time. This dude got there in 25 minutes, and everybody said this never happens. Um, I don't understand how he got there so quick, but he was there, um, and I had to stay as we step out the room, and I just stood there by the door, and I seen him. Uh, he opened his book thing up and writing something down, writing, and he pulled the... Uh, tag out and he put on her toe and asked what he doing there for and you know to identify her and you know make sure everything matches up and he took some information from the nurse gave him some stuff and you know you know gave him some information and um I seen him starting to pull you know he pulled this uh carp thing in with this reddish uh bag and when I seen him starting to pull her over towards this bag he unzipped it and pulled started pulling I'm like what he's gonna do with that don't put her in there when I tried to run her grab him um, so he wouldn't put her in there and that's when they grabbed me and the nurses and everybody just everybody turned me around and before I can get loose and turn back around he had already left and um, it was just like lightning how fast he was able to get her in there and leave and by the time we got home my neighbors had already started coming over bringing fruit dishes and breakfast foods and you know what can we do the police department and that's one thing I can say I had great support system. My family was there. Um, my neighbors came to school. You know, they were notified and, and they actually started coming by calling and her friends, their families, um, the police department and their families were there. The, even the fire department, the paramedics. And I mean, when I say the support was there, it was there. The Laney Foundation, Dr. Zahmer, and you know, I called her and, and told her she had people there and she, they, I mean, when I say the support system was, was amazing. I had a good support system and um, my sister said, well, we got to, you know, go um, plan our funeral. And 
get caskets and stuff, and we ended up going to the uh, funeral home, and um, we found pink is our favorite color, so uh, we ended up getting her a pink casket, and uh, my niece worked at the mall at the time, and uh, she ended up finding her a pink and white skirt, and like a pretty pink and uh, a pretty uh, white pink and white shirt shirt to match it, and um, we took that to the funeral home, and then they said we had to find a black leotard, and this is summertime, so we had to go all over to find a black leotard, because I guess they, you know, we're her autopsy, they, they didn't want nothing, her skin showing at all. Um, um, so we took that up there, and when I say, you know, I, it was just so much support. I mean, they were bringing in food and, and, and just what can we do? And people were going to the funeral home making payments. And, you know, I didn't, you know, it's just like, it was just amazing, you know, the support I got. And um, so I will forever be thankful for the village of Flossmoor, my neighbors of Flossmoor, the, the home of Flossmoor High School. and the teachers, the police department, the fire department, you know, I will always be grateful for them. Um, and uh, the day before the funeral, the um, funeral, had, funeral home had called me to come through her body and uh, um, we, me and my son and all of us, you know, we went up there and when they opened the door, so she was, you know, you stand in the door and you just see her up there and it's like, I thought I was gonna pass out at first, it just, it was like, this cannot be real. And um, so uh, my niece and them grabbed my arms and, you know, we walked in towards the casket and oh, seeing her sleeping in that casket, it was just like, you know, it just didn't seem real. And, you know, I'm, they were asking me, is everything okay? They want me to, it didn't even seem real, and um, her cousin uh, did her hair, and they were like, "Is her hair fine?" Her, you know, it's, I, it, I, I, it was just like, "Is this serious?" And my sister was like, yeah, "Everything is fine," and it just didn't seem real to me seeing your child in the casket, and I wouldn't wish this on nobody. This type of pain, because it's that's when it's starting. To, you're thinking that the child is not coming back, you know. I wouldn't wish this on nobody, you know. Um, so the next day was the funeral, and we did the funeral. And once we got to the cemetery, and I, I just, you know, when they when I seen them lower her body, it just it really just started hitting me. And just you know, them put her on the ground, and you know, you're trying to know, and then they have to pull you back, and you have to they have to just literally just pull you back because you don't want to see your child go on the ground, and it's trying to pull them out, and. You know, if you have not lost a child, you will never understand this. This, and, and I know people say they've lost, well, I've lost my parents, or I've lost my siblings, or I've lost this person, that person, my cat, my dog. It's just not the same when it's your child. You don't think your child is going to die before you. You think your child is going to bury you. Um, and I'm speaking for all the mothers, not just, it, it doesn't matter how you lose your child. It could be a homicide or suicide or, um, you know, cancer, hit by a car, the pain is the same, sorry, because our kids are not coming back. Love your kids while they're here. And I know some people say my kids get on my nerves, but honey, I'm telling you, if you have to ever put your child in that ground, whatever they did, you you just like, you wouldn't even, you know, it, it, it'll be nothing. Love your kids, love your family. You know, it, it, we have to start learning how to be kind to one another, learning how to appreciate one another. And I'm not just talking about with the kids, I'm just talking about in general. Um, after my daughter died, people said to me, black people don't kill themselves. And suicide is, is high in, in our African-American community. And I did a Zoom call a couple of days ago with black psychologists. And the statistics say that we have more suicides amongst our young ones done than homicides, but because of the stigmas and taboos, we don't even talk about it. We don't talk about the sexual assaults, the domestic violence. We don't really talk about any of these things. We sweep them onto the rug. And I think when we say black lives matter, all black lives should matter, all of us. It shouldn't matter how you look your child. It shouldn't matter um, your your economic segment or your status or, you know, 
how much you have or how much you don't have or where you live in, it should be we all matter. The homeless people should matter. The, and we should all get a sistership amongst each other and try to help uplift each other instead of always dragging each other down and down each other. The bro men should get a brothership and try to help uplift each other and, and be there for one another and just a family ship all together. And, you know, until it starts and ends with us, until we start showing more kindness and appreciation to one another, nobody else is going to do it. My name is Paul Pearson. I am a lecturer and professor at Chicago State University, uh, teaching philosophy, polo uh, political science, and I also facilitate courses for the city colleges related to law. As we look at um, our marginalized communities, our black and brown communities, um, we often um, blame uh, the victim. Um, we've created a uh, school to prison pipeline uh, in the era of mass incarceration uh, where we uh, blame uh, those who suffer traumas on a daily basis um, and say that they have to somehow pull themselves up by the bootstraps and make better choices um, when we have not actually offered them choices and or options uh, to begin with um, as um, we deal with uh, some of this um, uh, violence in our communities. We have to uh, find ways to not only appropriately address the violence, but we also have to address the traumas and the mental health concerns that are correlated to the violence itself. Uh, and in some instances, if we address the trauma, we can actually prevent the violence from occurring uh, in the first place. And with that being said, I'm so proud of Elizabeth and the works that she does uh, as someone who is in the prevention space, uh, trying to save lives before we get to situations where uh, we need additional services. Uh, her program, along with the mental health services that she advocates for, is something that I would put my life in uh, the belief and the hope that if we can actually have those things implemented and utilized um, correctly with a cultural, culturally competent lens uh, that we can in fact uh, address many of these concerns. I started MJG Movement and we help sexual assault victims, women going through domestic violence, um, men too, not just women. Um, suicide prevention, um, we have a few um, people that are sex, that, that have been sex trafficked. Um, I have mothers who have lost to gun violence, and I know the mothers who've lost to police shootings. You know, I help anybody who reaches out, because um, we all need it, we all hurt, we all grieve. Um, and with MJG Movement, what it is we do is, you know, if they need us to go to court and advocate with them at court, we'll do that. If they need us to help get them like a restraining order or something, if there's a domestic going on, we can do that. Um, some people may just need help finding housing or help getting housing. We do that. Um, you have people that may need help with food or utilities. We help with that. Um, we help with whatever. Each person is different. So, you know, different people ask for different things. So whatever we can help with is what we do. And at the end of the year, we will be opening up a safe house. And, you know, we'll be able to really do a lot of transitioning into that and helping families go through, you know, what I just said. And I also have an LLC, which is Marcy's Marvels, and that's what my comic books um, and my uh, lip gloss, my eyeshadow, my herbal teas, and, you know, we're building. And, and um, with the comic books, we're pushing that to um, be a movie or... Um, I, I want it to be like... Um, a miniseries, a Black Girl Resilience miniseries, what I would like it to be, but we're, you know, working on some things with that, and, you know, um, my name is Elizabeth Drell again, and um, I can be reached at, on Facebook. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Drell, which is G-E-R-A-L-D, and there's a T -F for Team Family, and then I also have an MJG Movement page on Facebook, and then an MJG Movement page on IG, and an MJG Movement page on uh, Twitter. This is my reality, you guys. This is my reality. And this is a lot of families' reality, not just mine. It's, I see so many moms, and I'm going to say dads, too, because I had a father reach out and say, fathers hurt, too. This is a lot of families. 
We're going through this. We have to do better by our culture. Um, we really have to do better. We really do. You took away my little sister, man. Like, the ways, like, before everything happened, she was just perfect, you know what I mean? She was doing everything a random uh, uh, a young girl would do, you know what I mean? Mama, I miss you, Mama. If you would like to share your story on my platform, please contact support at tajah7.com or contact me directly on my website at tajah7.com.